but if, if I was singing here, I wasn't sure if your listeners would s- stay on. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. <clears throat> well, here we go. Hello and welcome to Fine is a Four Letter Word. My guest today is Tony Jalen. Welcome to the show, Tony. Well, thank you for having me there, Lori. Glad to be here. Let's jump right into it. Okay. And not waste any time. What were the values and beliefs that you were raised with that contributed to who you've become as an adult? You know, great question. Um, I grew up in the family of nine children, and I'm the oldest in nine, seven girls, two boys. Wow. And one bathroom? One bathroom, and I wouldn't call that much of a bathroom. It was Are you small. kidding? I was joking. That's no. for real? Oh, <laughs> one bathroom. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It was one of those things that when mom said it was time to eat, you didn't hesitate. You went to the table. Because <laughs> otherwise there wouldn't be any food left? Right. Correct, correct. But somehow she'd always find ways to still make me pancakes or beans and rice. I don't know, one or two. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I would say, you know, values is, you know, be kind to others. You know, I saw that consistently with my parents, even though, quote unquote, they didn't have a lot in their checking account. Their give account, their kindness account was overfilled. Mm. And so, I mean, they would give the shirt off the back of people. Um, hard work, like excuses are off the table. You know, you you can figure out a way if you want the way. Yeah. And, of course, you know, faith and family was a big thing too. Cool. Um, okay. And so you've – as you grew up, those values are something that's played out in your life over time, right? Oh, 100%. I mean, I remember when I was like, I don't know, um, let's say eight, nine years old. I mean, I was working since I was seven years old. What did you start doing at seven? So my dad was a manual laborer and we did field work. So imagine getting up at 4.30 in the morning, putting on long pants, uh, jeans, Tucking your jeans into your socks, having a sweat over your head because you tuck your jeans in your socks so mice don't run up your legs. Oh my gosh! It's field work, and we'd be—I mean, we'd start in you know, the early, early morning, and we'd walk miles and miles and miles, and you know, hoeing weeds away from the sugar beets. Um, yeah, it was. Is my dad said, if you want some, you got just gotta go get it, and it wasn't like handouts. It was you really gotta go out there and get it. And I saw that with them. You know, they always would figure out a way. Okay. And then did you graduate to working at at something that didn't require you to put your pants into your socks? I did eventually. Um, <laughs> you know, I uh, it was like one of those things like I had a job when I was 14 years old. And uh, I, I can say this now because it was many years ago, but you're supposed to be 16 to get the job. They didn't right. ask me my age. And I'm like, all right, you know, and it was refinishing floors and in an apartment complex. And um, I'll never forget, I gotten paid on a Friday. And I was all excited, like, I got a paycheck, right? I was going to go to the mall, get some clothes, spend some money. And all of a sudden, the boss rolls up in his convertible, goes, hey, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going to go shopping. He goes, oh, we got work to do yet tonight. I'm like, what do you mean? He goes, oh, we got to r- rip out some carpets. And I'll never forget, I was working until 2, 3 o'clock in the morning. She's like shoveling off the, the rubber backing of carpet off of wood floors. Okay. So you didn't get to go to the mall. Did you go the next I, day? What, I, what? No, I was sleeping. <laughs> I was sleeping. <laughs> I was sleeping. Uh, you know, I think, you know, I had some good mentors growing up. I still have good mentors today. And I really believe that I'm a product of mentorship. And my mm-hmm. parents always encouraged me to take risks, to go out there and, and, and try things. And um, eventually I learned that I get paid more for m- my brain than my hands. Mm. Were you, did your brothers and sisters look up to you as a mentor? Um, I felt they did. And I felt like, you know, it was one of those things growing up, teachers would say, oh, you're Tony's brother, you're Tony's sister. Uh, you're Jalen. 
Mm-hmm. So we had a low reputation in that regard. And I, and I felt that because I felt that I could be the difference maker in my family. Like if, if I can show what was possible, it would inspire my family to do the same. Did it? I, I believe it did. I believe it did. I mean, you know, our, my mom and my dad, you know, they worked tirelessly. I mean, my dad worked from, you know, 5.30 in the morning till 7 p.m. at night. My mom would work 10 p.m. at night to 7 a.m. in the morning. And I feel today, people go, why do you work so hard? I go, well, if I don't work so hard, it's like I'm slapping my parents in the face for the mm-hmm. sacrifices that they made. And, you know, my brother is an M.D., uh, my sister has masters in teaching. Um, they own the semi-pro football team. Like all of them, do something in terms of contributing back to society, which is uh-huh. awesome. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So, since the show is called "Fine" is a four-letter word, mm-hmm. tell me the story of the time when you said everything was fine, but it really wasn't fine. You know, it's interesting when when you. S- when you and I talked about fine is the four letter word, I was having mm-hmm. a conversation with someone and they go, they said back to me, it's fine. And it, 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 right away I thought, okay, it's surely not fine. Like <laughs> you might as well say the F word if you're going to say fine. And I think fine is a, like a, a clean version of the F word. Right. Um, I think it was, a, it was, it's a lot of different periods in my life where I said I was fine, but I wasn't. I think part of it because I felt I had to show up. Mm-hmm. I had to show up for others. I had to be consistent regardless of the, the stuff that was going in, on in my life. I had to show up. And I think a lot of times you see that happen as a leader and you don't have someone to, you, you think you don't have someone to go in and share with, even though there's a lot of people that do want to share with you. I think probably back to, let's say 2015, 2016, I was at the top of my game, winning all these awards, made more income that I could possibly imagine. I mean, I'm really fortunate to have an opportunity in which I can do that with the company I work with. Um, and I was so fine, Lori, that I ballooned up to 300 pounds. Wow. Yes. And um, it was crazy. You would think because of the fact that, you know, didn't have to go, when I went to the store, I didn't ever have to think about how much I was spending. Uh Uh-huh. Ate sushi a lot. Um, But what had happened was is that without me realizing it at first, because when things start going backwards, you don't realize it right away. Yeah. It's a slow creep. It's a slow – it's incremental, right? You can have incremental growth and incremental downward, right? And I was falling off the tracks, you know, because I think what I did is I invested so much time early in my life in my personal growth and and learning that – call this ego, call it what you want. I felt like it creates such a divide, a positive divide between myself and others. I didn't push myself as hard anymore. Hmm. And because um, I just had learned so much. I experienced so much. I made had so many failures that I learned so much. But then um, I realized probably about 2016, 17, I probably closer to 17. Um, like I said, it was an incremental period of time that um, I was more likely in a depression. Mm. I would okay. come home. I'd work my tail off in the day. Everything would be pretty nice on the front end. But on Saturdays, I would literally go into my bedroom and be in the bedroom all day long. Wow. I'd still show up, though. Right. For other people, yeah. for but other not for pe- yourself. Oh, 100% for other people. And um, because that was what you did. There was not a choice in that. At least so that's what I thought. And well, because that's what you learned from your parents, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, I saw you my show dad. up no matter what. Show up. You show up. And I didn't start to realize that things started slipping until my life started slipping. In a lot of different areas. You know, um, complacency is a disease that creeps in. And I believe that creeped in for me in different places. Because I sometimes would ask myself, well, now what? Right? You know, I achieved this. You know, got all this in savings. Be able to do this and that. And I realized that my life was more focused on 
It was a goal-oriented life for like five, six years versus a growth-oriented life. Mm, right. Yeah, I'm just reading this book, The Code of the Extraordinary Mind by Vishen Lakhiani now. And oh, he's yeah. talking in it about different goals, about means goals and what was the other one? Means goals and... End goals? End goals. Yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Right. And the difference between them, whereas a means goal for people who don't aren't familiar or haven't read the book... A means goal is like, I need to get my degree. I need to get to this level of success in a company. It's a, like a means to an end, but what's the end goal? Like happiness or fulfillment or legacy. Mm -hmm. Those are the end goals, the ultimate thing that you're working for. And I think for me, I had growth goals for a while there. Like legacy is important to me. I want to know that my life mattered. I think a lot of people do. I think sure. there's there's two questions that we all ask ourselves. Am I enough? And am I loved? Yeah. Those are important questions and important uh Questions to answer, questions to feel. I'm, I'm thinking about how you want to feel. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I thought, I think for myself, I lost sight of those legacy things. Um, and, you know, I read my press clippings. Um, and plus people kept on coming to me for a source. I'm like, holy smokes, like, you know. And at first it was very humbling, scary. I mean, I remember there was a situation where I was in the Target Center, and it was and it was a business conference, and um, one of the speakers was actually recognized me from stage. Mm. And I'm like, there's twenty thousand people in this conference, and I'm like, holy smackerels! And then at the end of his talk, there was an intermission. People came up to me, and I had your this... ego is like eating this up, right? Oh, it wasn't though. At this moment, it wasn't. No. At first, I, I say it, it ate it up for about 10 seconds. And then I freaked out. I literally, like, all I'm doing is doing the work. Like, that's why I, 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 this is no joke, Lori. Mid sentence, I walked away from all of them. Didn't say goodbye. Didn't say I gotta go. Because I felt like I wasn't worthy. Wow. Okay. Of, of that, because I still felt like I haven't even done anything yet. Because in my mind, I had a certain expectation for myself. And I think mm -hmm. then what happened then is when I got to that fine period of time is I wasn't as open to feedback. You know, um, I wasn't seeking feedback as much. Were and you not seeking feedback because you thought you didn't need it or because you didn't think you were worthy of getting it? Of like, like that people would want to give you feedback. I think it was part of it during that period of time was I felt people thought that I already knew. Mm. Did you feel like you already knew? I felt and sometimes I did know, yet at the same time I felt scared to say, hey, you know, I'm really struggling in this part right now. Mm. Um, I need some help. You know, here's how I've gone through it. Here's where I feel like I need some help on. Because um, there's... There's protection in that covenant with others, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to be, be vulnerable, to be able to be yourself in it. And during that fine period of my life, I, I felt, I told a story to myself that, oh, I can't ask. Because then, you know, they look up to you for certain things, but to realize that, and there was a, going through the depression, Going into the hospital, them telling me, asking me, who do I have for my living will? It was a wake up call, like, holy crap. Wait, back up. So, what about what was the hospital thing? So, what happened was, this is like, I was like 2017, I believe is when that happened, um, or maybe 18. Um, gonna go see my massage therapist, and also I'm going up the stairs to see, see her. I couldn't breathe. And she's like, are you okay? I'm like, oh, I'm going to be fine. I'm going to be fine. Everything like that. And I had a racquetball tournament coming up, so I needed to make sure I was loosened up. And she goes, you don't look good. You need to go to the doctor. 
Hmm. I'm like, I am going to be fine. Fine, right? Right. <laughs> and um, she goes, no, you're going to doctor now. You're calling the doctor now. I got on the phone with them, and they said, come to the ER. I'm like, what are you guys talking about? I'm fine. Mm-hmm. And I get to the ER. They had a wheelchair waiting for me. They rolled me into the room, give me these nitro tablets, something like that, hook up all the AKGs, the whole nine yards. And the doctor comes in, the heart surgeon comes in, and he says, I'm 99% positive that you have blockage. And I'm like, no way. This is not happening to me. And of course, mm-hmm. I'm going through this complete period of beating myself up. Right. Because I'm like, I made these choices. I made these decisions. I know better. And the worst part was when my family walked into the hospital room. And the look on their face told me that, oh, my gosh, like Superman is down. Mm. So you felt like you were letting them down. Oh, 100%. And then that night, the, you know, the sirens goes off because my heart rate got too low. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. And I just had a good discussion with my maker and said, so, you know, I I made mistakes. I'm sorry for those mistakes. Forgive me. I'm going to do better. I'm going to go ahead and fulfill the gift that you've given me. And that went to surgery. Doctor came back to me after surgery. He goes, I don't know how to tell you this. He goes, I've done thousands of these surgeries. But you have zero blockage. We didn't have to put any stents in. So they had no explanation, really, for what happened to you. Mm-mm. Not at all. Um, and so that really started making me change things in terms of to have an attitude of gratitude. Mm-hmm. And to, you know, I think it's so easy to focus on what's wrong because what's wrong is always going to be present. There's always things that are, you're always going to see things that are wrong if you're looking for them. Yeah, you know, and... Um, I realized that I wasn't probably as appreciative. I may have had a positive attitude, mm-hmm. but I wasn't appreciative. I wasn't really thankful. And people go, well, sure you're thankful. I go, no, I wasn't practicing intentional gratitude. Yeah. I wasn't. And, you know, literally since that time, I've had 1,237 days straight of gratitude journaling. With 8,000 moments of gratitudes. And I read back through that. I'm like, man, it made me realize I'm pretty blessed. I, mm-hmm. I've been given a great life with great people that surround me. And just to be continually mindful of being that growth-oriented mindset versus just the goal-oriented mindset. You mentioned earlier that you had been so overweight were you that weight when you had this heart issue? Mm-hmm. And then once you got out of the hospital and started practicing gratitude, that do you feel like that contributed then to your becoming more healthy physically, not just mentally, psychologically, but also physically? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I was letting the world rule me, right? Mm-hmm. I, was, I, was, I was succumbing to all the world's demands. And I think sometimes the best way to show love to others is showing your own self, self-love. self Yeah, that's so powerful. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, just, it was a matter of a year. I got my life insurance done. And my advisor comes to me and goes, Tony, this is crazy, but you rank in the top 1% of people who did the test. Like, I can give you more coverage. He goes, 18-year-olds don't get this. Um, because I got more intentional again with my life. I got intentional, intentional in terms of – of how I show up and why I do what I do and you know have the journaling the writing the the goals getting together with different mastermind groups and just going back to that childlike curiosity and faith Hmm. how did you find those groups those support those peer strategy or or support groups that you're talking about I think at first I just wrote it down that you wanted to find them I want to find them. And I truly believe, you know, what you write down is what you give life to. 
And if you're constantly looking at it, like people came into my life, Lori, that I am so thankful for today. Like I have one of my mentors is a uh, CEO of, of a former CEO of a Fortune 500 company. And I hopped on a call, uh, a leadership call, and there was uh, tons of people on this call. And out of nowhere, he asked me to s stay on the call to talk with me later and says to me, you know, who's your mentor right now? Who are you tapping into? Mm -hmm. That's willing to go ahead and get in your face and call your bullshit. <laughs> right. Wow. Man, I really I really don't have anyone. And man, I tell you, Wednesday nights at 9 p.m., I'd go in my garage, be on the phone call with them, and I'd get done, I'd come back inside, them is like, what happened? Because <laughs> he, like, carved me up, sliced me up, and he just knew things. He said, Tony, I've been in your shoes before. I see my former self starting to come out of you. Uh -huh. he, goes, he goes, we got to own our stuff. Yeah. You got to own it. And it sucks to own where you're at sometimes. But if you want to grow, like the first step to, to growth is awareness. Yes. And those are the hardest things to admit. It was hard for me to admit that I was taking the easy route in my meal planning. It was, an, it, was, it was hard for me to admit I was taking the easy path in terms of my relationships. I mean, I think part of me, too, was thinking I worked so hard to get to this point. Mm -hmm. I know it's going to take even more effort to get that next point. So I was going through that internal battle. Has it been harder or is it easier because you're intentional? Like you thought it was going to be harder to get to the next level, but because you have this intentional and now you have this gratitude practice, not that it's not still work, but is it easier than you thought it was before you started this way? It is now. I, say, I would say it's simpler versus mm -hmm. easier because I got clarity, you know, and the more you do things, the more clarity you get. Yeah, I think that's a, a cycle. The more clarity you have, the more you get done. And the more you get done, the more clarity you get. And so it's, it builds on itself. Well, that goes back to one of your first questions you asked me in the beginning. What are your values? And I think unless you define what your values are, you will succumb easier to other people's values. Yes. Because when you are clear in what you stand for, you can set your boundaries. Yep. And it also makes it better, better, easier to make decisions because you can come back to, does this fit with my values or not? And it makes it very easy to say no to what doesn't fit. Yeah. I mean, I had a situation where I was at a networking event. And sometimes at these different events, I like to s sit in the back and just get a gathering of the room a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you may think this was a, s a smart ass comment that I said to this person. Um, today, he, he, him and I are friends. I didn't introduce myself in this networking event. I didn't get up and introduce myself. I just stood, sat down, and just took it all in. And he said to me, he, this is the, him and I had not met yet. And he said to me, he goes, um, you didn't introduce yourself. I go, no, I didn't. He goes, well, I don't know if I like that. I go, well, it's your thought. Own it. It's okay. <laughs> Everyone laughed. Uh, and he laughed too, but I had to start realizing that, and this is still something I'm working on, is that I care what others think, yet and they also I don't care what others think. Mm -hmm. And that's a fine line, right? Um, not, no pun intended, fine, but yeah, you know, I care the fact that you and I have a good interaction, you know. Um, yet if we disagree on something, I don't care. It's okay. Like right. it's okay to, it's okay to agree to disagree. Yeah. It's, it's okay to care because you want to create a relationship mm -hmm. and have a, a conversation that is meaningful. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you don't care what I think of you in particular. Like we can't care what other people think of us and let that dictate who we are and what, what actions we take if those are, if the actions we're taking are truly in line with our values. Mm -hmm. 
and growing up that was a big challenge for me and it's still to these day I have my challenges with it um, you know I grew up with very little means you know um, we, we had food stamps mm-hmm. and if your listeners don't know what food stamps is it's like today they give you a little card back then it was funny play money right and I remember like when I realized what it was, I felt so embarrassed. How old were you? I, oh, I was, when I started being aware of it, probably 12, 13 years old. Okay. I would, I would wait in the aisle for other people to go to the cash register before I would. Mm-hmm. You know? And then when I moved schools and all of a sudden the popular kids all wanted me to come hang out at their houses, I wouldn't do it because my mind was thinking, no, they're going to want to come to my house. You know, and um, it was a big thing for me to be liked. Sure. And I wanted to fit in. I wanted to be part of those groups. And then, you know, I, I look now to some of the wisdom my father taught me. He's like, Tony, the wealthiest person isn't the one who has the most. It's the one who needs the least. That's an, I'm thinking about that. Because I'm not sure that I, that needing, I guess the word needing is what we need to, need to, you know, mm-hmm. uncover, but, because uh, I do think that people as humans need each other because we're wired to connect. So there's a lot to I mean, unpack what, in there. Right. Well, I think what he was talking about is the material things. Like he goes, yeah. I want you to do well. I want you to do your best. Right. But he goes, your car doesn't make you your the shoes you wear doesn't make you. Yeah. You know who you are, what is what makes you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, be you like my dad was a five foot four funny guy. He'd always kid around with people, joke around with people. They probably couldn't understand what he was saying sometimes because <laughs> of his um, um, accent. <laughs> and. uh You know, just be you. And I think that's why so many people revered him and my mom and respect them because they are them. Uh Uh-huh. And, you know, they're they're not afraid to share their opinions. (laughs) Yeah. Well, and it sounds like that's who you've become now, too. More comfortable. And I think that happens as we get older for a lot of people that we become more comfortable in who, in being who we are. Well, I think change doesn't happen until we're tired of where we're at. Of course. You know, and you know, there's a saying that says, pain brings change. Yes. Much more than, oh, I just feel like I'm going to become somebody different today. Like pain is the, the motivator, is a bigger motivator than, um, what, isn't it Tony Robbins who talks about pain being, you can be motivated by pain or um, pleasure. 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 Yep. Right. But, but people are far more motivated by pain. Yeah, like you put me in the corner, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fight. I am yeah. going to come at you with guns a blazing. Say that I can't do it. Okay, watch. I'll mm-hmm. do it. Um, and we, I know we're all wired a little bit differently, but looking at the times in which I've made massive change in my life is when it hurt. Mm-hmm. When I was, when I was in the valley, not on the mountaintop. But when I was in the valley is when I grew. Yeah. Yeah. What's motivating you today? Seeing people win. Seeing people like realize, hey, here's my obstacle in front of me right now and helping them remove that. Like that gets me so jazzed. (laughs) When I when I get this chance to see people say, Okay, Tony, I feel like my life is unorganized. I feel like I'm all over the place. I'm tired of being tired. And all of a sudden we can sit down and say, Okay, listen, let's let's assess where you're at. And then helping them develop a simple plan to get out of that rut. And they come back to me later like, oh, my gosh, Tony. Like, this is so simple. Why didn't I figure that out? I go, because you're in the thick of it. Right. You know, and the thing is, our when we ask better questions of ourselves, it's how we improve our lives. Right. And sometimes we don't know what questions to ask of ourselves because of what you just said. We're in the thick of it. So we all need mentors 
and coaches or whoever, however you want to label somebody, but somebody from the outside to look in and say, hey, here's what I'm seeing. Here's what I suggest you could try. Well, a lot of it times is, is that there's so much things today demanding our attention and our time. Yes. That I feel, based off my experiences in talking to people, that people simply just don't have the time to talk, mm. to think. And, and creating that space for people just to sit there and just listen to them is probably one of the best gifts I can give anyone. Yes, so few people have the ability to share space, to hold space. I call it holding space for someone else to share their thoughts and feelings just to help them process, you know, to get speak out loud and process through their own thing. You don't even really have to do a whole lot. <laughs> Maybe ask I a don't. couple of questions to get them thinking, and then they can come up with their own answers and tap into their own truth. Again, the, you know, this comes back to the whole thing of what I'm doing with corporate teams in terms of teaching them about how to use gratitude, which we've talked about a lot in our previous conversation. Use gratitude, use meditation to tap into that inner knowing and then use that to fuel success. Well, and... Like for me, one of the things I do is uh, I have a weekly reflection and planning time. And it's part of, I have a daily routine in the morning too. And I have a book right here. It has all my, my vision board on it. It has mm -hmm. my, my monthly, my weekly plans in here. Um, I think that's just so important. Like you're either, life is either taking you by the reins or you're taking life by the reins. Mm -hmm. And taking that true time to be present in the moment. Like there's a breathing technique that I'll do some days and I'll just go like breathe out. It says right, breathe in, here. Right here, right here, mm. right here, right here. Um, because if I don't, I'm going, I'm going nonstop. And right. I think a lot of people just need time to think space to think because the answer is 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 within every single one of us every one of us has the answer absolutely and when people say i don't know that means we need that means that you're telling me that this is what i'm learning that you haven't worked yet to find the no or gotten quiet enough to listen to hear it every time i ask the questions like like some of the questions i ask in the morning is like hey how can I serve someone today? How can I make a difference today? And literally it's a part of my daily intentions. And I ask, and I have a group of that gets my YouTube videos that I'll, I'll listen to and I'll share, I'm like, okay. And I'll go through it after asking that question. And it's one that usually will just stand out to me. And I'll listen to it, I'm like, oh, that's what I needed to hear today. Mm -hmm. Isn't I it ask, interesting like, when you ask the question, the answer shows up. It does. It may not always come in the form that you want it. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. But, but don't mistake the form for the function. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes I'll go, really? This is what you want me to do? Okay. All right. And then I it trust. becomes, I was just going to say, then it becomes a matter of trust. It does. And, you know, it's like you listen to one of the two voices, either the one that's asking the questions or the one that's telling you things. Mm. Yeah, there's a combination there. Mm -hmm. And just, yeah, you got to be, in, the more t time you take time to think for yourself and just creating a space for you. I'm talking emails down, notifications on your phone. I'm like, people think I'm nuts. You look at my phone, it's literally on silent, not vibrate, silent. The only notification I have on there is my screen time notification that comes up and my calendar that comes up, mm -hmm. nothing else. People go, well, what if you miss something? I go, I miss it. Right, the world doesn't end. No, like I, I would send a message on my, um, my vacation, respond out, and I'll say, if this is a 911 situation, you can text me. 
Mm-hmm. And I've done that for years. You know how many text messages I've ever gotten? Maybe one. You're reminding me of back when I worked in uh, for a marketing advertising agency and I would have to focus. And this was before even social media. So we didn't have those kinds of distractions. But you work in an office and people are always coming by and wanting to chat and you know, there's plenty of, still were plenty of distractions. So I used to shut my door and put a note on it that said, unless the building is on fire, do not disturb me right now. And you know what though? I mean, sometimes we got to go ahead and make it so dramatic that people go, okay, like it, you're actually helping other people by putting it into perspective. Yeah. Like when someone has a situation or I go through a situation where I'm getting a little worked up, I have a saying that anyone knows me knows this. I say it. My son says it to me now, which somewhat makes me go, damn, it does have an impact, <laughs> doesn't it? I go, well, you know, I, I hear this, um, but he, did anyone die or go to jail? Oh, and, oh, no. Okay, then. You know, we're going to work through this. Like, nothing lasts forever. Right. It's going to be all right. It's all, as Marie Forleo says, it's all figure outable. It is. And you're going to keep doing things until you figure it out. Everything is figure outable, which is pretty much what your parents taught you. Oh, yeah. Coming yeah. full circle back to the beginning of our conversation. And I think, too, like when things that would be my pet peeves is when I hear the word, I can't. Mm. Like that will freaking drive me up the wall. And I go, like someone says, oh, I can't do it. I go, okay, I hear what you're saying. But what I'm really saying is that you're not willing. Mm-hmm. Just tell me that. Just tell me that you're not willing. Right. Because that is truly what it is. Right. Or I don't have time. Well, I, I hear you. But what you're telling me, what I'm hearing, is that it's just not a priority for you. And that's okay. Right. Just right. tell me that. Just admit it to yeah. yourself that it's yeah. not. And that's hard. Like, it it's takes hard. practice. It's very hard. You know? But, you know, what we, I have a, a, a colleague, he says, you know, you get to choose your heart. Yes. Yeah. Right. I have rem- uh, had a conversation with a past podcast guest, Jess Lilly, and we were talking about the pain of, oh, something about the pain of doing it now and the hard now mm-hmm. or the pain of regret later. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I mean, when I look at, situations I have like four or five questions that I go through in terms of problem solving like what's what's the problem what's the cause of that problem like no BS what's the cause of the problem Mm -hmm. what's the cost of letting that problem keep on going on because it puts in perspective right yeah is this actually something I need to actually invest time or not with and then the next thing is okay so what are some possible solutions and then what is the best, what's the best solution right now? Let's, let's make a decision. Because mm-hmm. no decision is still a decision. Yes. And once you make a decision and get into action, a lot of time, then it's not a problem anymore. No, no. Because we spend so much time ruminating. Ruminating. Ruminating, yes. Thank you. On the problem, when we spend more time on the solution. So I literally, like I'm all about, you got to have a system. You have a problem-solving system? Great. What's the problem? What's the cause of it? What's the cost of it? You know, what are some possible solutions and what's the best one? I love it. Wow. This conversation has been so incredible. Thank you so much, Tony. Before we go, I know that you have a song that you listen to and you need to get hyped up. Although yes. you seem pretty, you, you seem pretty chill, but I'm sure there are times when you need to boost your energy. What's your song? All I do is win-win. Good one. And it was funny because I was listening, and <laughs> there's a part in that song where he talks about the you, and I used to, we used to laugh about that all the time back in the 80s. In, mm-hmm. It's in reference to University of Miami and how they just refer to themselves as the you, like so much ego there. And you are so not that, but it just made me laugh to, to hear that. Well, if, if the way I look at it, if I get up in the day, I just won. Like, literally, if, if I'm having the opportunity to breathe, to see, to hear, I already won. Yeah. Well, someone, you, else didn't, someone else didn't get a chance to do that. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yeah, we could get into a whole other part of a conversation, but have it just because we are here on this earth as humans in this time, that's winning. Like we won like the genetic lottery, but because we're top of the food chain right now. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So again, thank you so much. We could, I'm sure, continue this for another hour, but we'll, we'll leave it at this for now. Thanks for joining awesome. me today on Fine is a Four-Letter Word. Well, Lori, thank you for having me. It's absolutely been an absolute joy. And um, yeah, if there's anything else I can do for you or any of your listeners, feel oh, free to reach out. Oh, you know what? Before we go, how can okay. people, if they want to continue this conversation with you, how can they do that? It's simple. You can go ahead and do smoke signals. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> see, I'm, on, I'm on LinkedIn. Just literally type in my name, Tony Jalen, LinkedIn. You'll find me there. You can text message me. There's a number for text messages to have a coffee meeting as well. Um, I just feel that the more we can go ahead and connect and collaborate with one another, we can make this world a better place. And we just got to do it together. For sure. For sure. We'll put links in the show notes for all of that. And again, thank you for joining me on Fine is a Four-Letter Word. Thank you, Lori.